Well, last week we began a new multi-week study series based on the New Testament book of James. And in that first week, we pursued the preliminary, preliminary goal of establishing some basic information concerning the identity of the author, the historical timing, the subject of his letter, and the intended readership. And you may recall that the opening verses of James chapter 1 says, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations. Greetings. All of us have, have walked out to the mailbox to find an envelope addressed to a generic recipient, uh, such as resident or or homeowner, marked with a return address that we don't recognize that doesn't do much to identify the sender or the nature of the letter. Since the name James appears 42 times in the New Testament and refers to at least five different people, if we want to know which James sent this letter, we must do some research. And, and like junk mail, if we don't know which James sent it, we may suspect that it's an insignificant letter that isn't worth opening. Nonetheless, on the outside chance that there's a big, fat payoff inside, we must open it anyway. Reading at least a few times, uh, or a few lines in the letter, to see what it's all about. And again, like junk mail, rather than a letter sent to a particular group, such as Paul's letter to the Corinthians, or a specific person, such as Paul's letter to Timothy, whoever James is, he addresses his letter to a much broader group. That said, James' letter is well worth the read for all believers. Last week, using scripture from other New Testament letters and the four Gospels, we confirm what Bible scholars already tell us, concluding that James... This James that wrote this letter is the half-brother of Jesus. He is the author of the book of James. We also learned that none of Jesus' brothers believed who he was said he was until after witnessing him in resurrected form. Scripture written by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 suggests that the resurrected Jesus made a special post-resurrection effort to appear to his unbelieving brother, further implying that through this supernatural visit, James became an apostle in much the same way that Paul himself did. Through these scriptures in the book of Acts, we also know that James played a significant role in the early church, presiding over the Jerusalem Council, a meeting where the early church decided that they would no longer require Gentiles to become Jews before they became Christians. Did away with that whole, officially did away with that whole argument of circumcision. In short, James became a gracious leader through whom the early church was richly blessed. As far as the intended recipients of James' letter, we established that it was, he was writing to Messianic Jews. These are Jews who believe, as all do Christians, that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah, and that he died in atonement for the sins of mankind. While James' early gospel work was centered in Jerusalem, his letter was written to the many Jewish believers who fled Jerusalem and scattered throughout the cities and regions of the Roman Empire as persecution intensified after the stoning of Stephen. So with this brief summary, if you're just joining us for this series, this basic information will kind of catch you up to where we are today However, I encourage you to watch the recorded live streams of last week's services if you weren't here as we covered a wealth of details uh, that I think will help you get the most out of this study. Watching last week's message should also help dispel a widely held misconception that accuses James of holding on to Old Testament ideas concerning the role of works in salvation rather than the emphasis Paul places on the free grace, uh, gift of grace brought about by Christ Jesus. Paul passionately taught that. We ended last week with a sneak peek of this morning's message, something to, to kind of wet our whistle for the kind of uh, in-your-face lessons that James will teach us over the next few weeks. And today we're going to begin our first in-depth in look 
at the book of James by reading the first 18 verses of chapter 1, which has to do with physical and emotional trials and spiritual temptations. These are two challenging aspects of living out our new lives in Christ. So, beginning in verse 1, again, James writes, James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes scattered among the nations, greetings. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because anyone who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position. But the rich should take pride in their humiliation, since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. Blessed is the one who perseveres under trial, because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he has created. So now that, that we've read this first section of James, this morning I want to go back through this passage and I want to examine some of the, the central verses and, and break down some sentences to better see what James is saying. So let's do it. Verses 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your fate produces perseverance. What's James trying to say here? He says, consider it pure joy, or count it all joy, as other Bible versions render this phrase. Since consider is the first word in the opening sentence, to fully understand James' message, we must consider the word consider. The English word consider is a verb that essentially means this is what you do in your mind. When this happens, you have to think about it. But in the original Greek text, the word translated as considered or, or count is a financial term that means to evaluate. So when James says to consider or count it all joy, he's encouraging his readers to evaluate how they're looking at their trials. That is to essentially to take a deep breath and look at the big picture. In essence, James calls us to develop a new and improved attitude that considers our trials from God's eternal perspective. Now you may remember uh, that in some scripture from James chapter 4 that we just looked at in a recent message, James says, now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Well, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. So time-wise, this passage describes human life from God's eternal perspective, meaning that for, for believers, the years that we spend in grief and pain and fear 
that, that, we, that we're going through now, in the future, those things will be merely pebbles in the road if we view our lives in an in eternal perspective and then look forward to the day that, that we'll spend basking in the eternal promises of the everlasting God. So it's all a matter of perspective. James' message is that as we live our new lives in Christ, we shouldn't be caught off guard nor run over by a freight train when a sudden trial comes upon us. Trials are a part of the Christian experience. In John 16, 33, Jesus told his disciples, in this world, you will have trouble. That, that's just a fact. Before we move on, there's another phrase here in, in this scripture that's worth looking at. And that phrase is trials of many kinds. Trials of many kinds. Why does James include that phrase? In the experiences that, that we share together in this fellowship, we all know that like Baskin Robbins ice cream, trials come in many different flavors. To name a few, again, there's grief, there's anger, there's fear, there's despair, there's jealousy, there's spite. Those are all bestsellers among the many flavors of emotional trials. And then there's sickness, disease, birth defects, and old age that limits our mobility. Those things represent a catalog of physical trials and challenges that, that we may become subject to. But once we read what James says in later verses, we're going to see that his words in these early verses also address the spiritual trials that come our way in various forms of temptation. In other scriptures, the Greek word translated as trials is the exact same word this translated as temptation, and that includes the, the gospel accounts of the temptation of Christ. That's the Greek word, same word. So the phrase trials of many kinds includes spiritual trials. Thus, James' words aren't limited to these physical and emotional circumstances that we usually associate with the scripture. Understand that we don't rejoice over temptation. We rejoice over the victory given to us in Christ Jesus. So now that we've considered the word consider, we need to consider the word joy. Again, James says, consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Typically, uh, a trial is not an occasion for joy. So James is, is not suggesting that we court hardship. Oh, Lord, send me a trial. We know that's not what he's saying. Or pretend that our trials are reason for joy. All of us know, in fact, we know well in the past year, that, that trials are difficult and painful. However, in God's perfect will, we can live our lives understanding that they exist for a purpose. Trials have the potential to produce something good in us. And for this reason, with an eternal perspective, they can become an opportunity for us to express joy. Amen? Nine months after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, I found myself alone in an ICU room, unable to speak, unable to have visitors or talk on the phone, struggling for every breath that was keeping me alive. Four days in, my doctor came into my room with a grim look on his face, and he explained that despite treatment, my conditioning uh, condition was deteriorating. And while he encouraged me against giving up, he expressed frank concern about where my illness would end up. He clearly raised a red flag warning, but as he left my room, I somehow experienced an incredible sense of peace. How can this be? I immediately remembered this scripture and considered that whether I left that hospital in a wheelchair or a body bag, that would not be the end of Chris Mason. And for that moment, for that moment, rather than fear, the Spirit allowed me to see my circumstances in God's eternal perspective. In the days ahead, I was able to joyfully experience uh, some improvement 
and share my joy with the people that were taking care of me to the point that I almost believe they left me on a bypath at night longer than I needed to be on one to keep me from talking about Jesus because any time I said more than a few words, my oxygen level dropped. Though the idea of joy runs contrary to, to our typical reaction to human difficulty, James urges us to continually work on changing our attitude towards our troubles from dread to positive expectation, faith, trust, and even joy. Amen. Next, James writes, If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who, generously, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. Raising two boys, y'all forgive me for saying that, two morons, it required wisdom that I didn't have. Pastoring this church, a church that generally runs with a perceived limited level of resources, often requires wisdom that I don't have. So where can we find wisdom when we need it? The Bible has much to say about seeking wise counsel, particularly in that book of Proverbs. Proverbs twenty-seven seventeen says that as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Proverbs nineteen twenty says, listen to advice and accept discipline, and at the end you will be counted among the wise. And Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of fools seems right to them, but the wise listen to advice. Who wrote the book of Proverbs? Solomon. I was going to give you a hint if you needed it. I'm glad I didn't have to. Uh, the hint was that it's not Dr. Phil or Oprah, okay? King Solomon is regarded as the wisest man who ever lived. And the Bible says that men traveled thousands of miles to hear the wisdom he imparted. How did King Solomon become so wise? More than a thousand years before Christ was crucified, Solomon married some old gal, and they moved to Jerusalem to build the temple. And to accomplish that, he hired 30,000 Israelites, 70,000 local laborers, 80,000 quarry workers, and 3,600 foremen. That's a total of 183,600 workers. Now, when I started comparing that with the number of guys that, that I used to supervise, it means that 182,000 employees were either late for work or called in sick every Monday morning. <laughs> Solomon, you know, he apparently knew how to do a lot of stuff, but Solomon would need more than knowledge and abilities to build the temple. He would need wisdom. In 1 Kings uh, chapter 3, beginning in verse 3, we read, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given to him by his father David, except that he offered sacrifice and burned incense on the high places. The king went to Gibeon to offer sacrifices, for that was the most important high place, and Solomon offered a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for whatever you want me to give you. Solomon answered, You have shown great kindness to your servant and my father David, because he was faithful to you and righteous and upright in heart. You have continued this kindness to him and have given him a son to sit on his throne this very day. Now, Lord my God, you have made your servant king in place of my father David. But I'm only a little child, and I do not know how to carry out my duties. Your servant is here among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this, and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have you asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will, 
Never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you have asked, what you have not asked for, both wealth and honor, so that in your lifetime you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father did, I will give you a long life. So Solomon asked God for wisdom, and God promised that he would make Solomon wise. Did God keep his promise? To find out, all we have to do is turn over one chapter to, to 1 Kings uh, chapter 4, and begin in verse 29 and see what God did. It says, God gave Solomon wisdom and very great insight, and a breath of understanding as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom was greater than the wisdom of all the people of the east and greater than all the wisdom of Egypt. He was wiser than anyone else, including Ethan the Ezraite, wiser than Haman, Calcol, and Dardia, the sons of Mahol. And his fame spread to all the surrounding nations. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. He spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon to the hyssop that grows out of walls. He spoke about animals and birds and reptiles and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. Solomon asked God for wisdom and God gave it to him. So the story of Solomon is an Old Testament example that backs up James' advice for us and for those in circumstances that require great wisdom. However, we should note that while people came to Solomon for wisdom, he was not the source of his wisdom. Therefore, as you seek wise counsel, you must look to godly men and women. In the wisdom or if the wisdom of the person you go to for advice isn't godly wisdom, that person is just another fool who is right in their own eyes. In 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19, Paul writes, Stop deceiving yourselves, or do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you're wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. So I think, I think what Paul is saying here in this scripture is that, that not every hole somebody digs turns out to be a well. Next, James reminds us that when we ask for wisdom, we should do so always believing with faith that God will provide what we ask for. He says, but when you ask, you must believe and not doubt. Because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is double-minded and unstable in all they do. So here in, in this verse, you see the first of something that I told you to watch out for last week. Uh, throughout the book of James, uh, I mentioned that we will learn that James clearly despises two things, and that's hypocrisy and double-mindedness. What does it mean to be double-minded? The term double-minded comes from a Greek word that means a, essentially a person with two minds or two souls. Interesting, uh, interestingly, I can't talk this morning. This verse marks the only time that this Greek word translated double-minded is used in the New Testament. However, it seems that Jesus had in mind the same kind of person in Matthew 6 when he spoke of someone who tries to serve two masters. So again, as such, that kind of person is unstable, which comes from a Greek word meaning unsteady or, or wavering in both his character and feelings. So a double-minded person represents the opposite of peace. He is restless and confused in thought, action, and behavior. Let it be said that such a person is always in conflict with themselves. One experiencing uh, such inner conflict can never experience complete confidence in God and his promises. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, 
Now, faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. So a double-minded person does not have this true Hebrews 11.1 1 faith. Next, in verses 9 and 10, James says, Believers in humble circumstances ought to take pride in their high position, but the rich should take pride in their humiliation since they will pass away like a wildflower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant, its blossoms falls, and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich will fade away even while they go about their business. So here, James just essentially says that in God's eternal perspective, believers should take pride in their position, not what they have on this earth, whether you're poor or rich, but in their position as heirs to the richness of the glory of God. His bottom line says that in terms of eternity, money and material possessions are temporary blessings that will become worthless. Then in verse 12, James again offers uh, an eternal perspective of our temporary trials and circumstances. He says, blessed is the one who perseveres under trial because having stood the test, that person will receive the crown of life that the Lord has promised to those who love him. Often, as we try to see our way through a, a difficult season, we can't see the forest for the trees. Simply said, we, we simply look, you know, we lose sight of that bigger picture. And in those times, James urges us to open our eyes to God's perspective, so that we might see some divine purpose behind the trials we face. Now, while we often equate that word blessed with the word happy, the word blessed in this verse is translated from the Greek word makarios, which means uh, in, in, in standard Greek, in, in society's Greek, it means blessed and happy. Makarios in biblical context, means much more than happy or fortunate, speaking of someone highly favored with grace from God. James uses this term repeatedly throughout his book, and Jesus uses the same term repeatedly throughout the Beatitudes at the beginning of the famous Sermon on the Mount to describe the life of a citizen in God's kingdom. Y'all will remember that. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. So y'all know, y'all are familiar with that. Y'all know the drill. In last week's message, I mentioned a, a course on the book of James offered through the Dallas Theological Seminary that I completed some time ago. And as he covered this section of James, the professor who taught the course offered something that I thought was very helpful in understanding James's use of the word blessed. He suggested that we try substituting the word blessed with the word Congratulations. To those who are poor in spirit, congratulations. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. To those who mourn, congratulations. You will be comforted. For those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, congratulations. You will be filled. For those who persevere under trial, congratulations. You will receive the crown of life. Amen. As we enter the kingdom of God by the way of salvation, the way we see our life should change to the new hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That, that verb perseveres that James uses describes one who faces and withstands trials with courage. So again, James is not saying that experiencing a trial is a blessing in itself. Instead, James says that the steadfast endurance in our trials brings God's blessed gift which he refers to as the crown of life. In essence, James says that those who persevere are blessed and fulfilled because they live under the king's rule and precepts in all circumstances. When we embrace problems from heaven's viewpoint, the Spirit helps us recognize the opportunities we have for personal growth and spiritual enrichment 
that trials can produce in us if we wait to receive our crowns. Last but not least, in verses uh, 13 through 16, James says, When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. What can we say about this passage? First, I want you to note who is missing in this passage. Notice that rather than naming Satan, James credits sin to one's own desires. Second, ask yourself how many of those that you know or may be acquainted with who find themselves living in the chains of substance abuse got that way through the brutal reality of a trial or unfortunate circumstance that they were going through. Uh, now, I, I can tell you all firsthand that but God, I would be looking everywhere for something to dull the pain of losing my son. But be warned that once we place all our focus on self-help and relieving our circumstances and lose sight of God's eternal perspective, we will inevitably slide down a slippery slope that bottoms out in sin. Every time, 100% of the time. Staying with that little metaphor, uh, instead of the valley, James points us to the mountaintop where an eternal crown awaits us as we receive the promises of God. Finally, in, in verses 17 and 18, James summarizes all that he has said concerning trials and temptation Reminds us that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. He chose to give us birth through the word of truth, that we might be a kind of first fruit of all he has created. So here James wraps all this up by contrasting the new birth believer's experience against sin which is given birth by human desires and enticements. Remember that according to James, desire gives birth to sin, and sin gives birth to death. That's what he says. So in contrast, sin brings forth death, and salvation gives new life to the redeemed, sanctified children, making you and I the first fruits of all created creatures. Y'all chew on that this week. With that, I think we'll stop here for today and we're going to pick up next week in, in verse 19 where James helps us balance merely listening to God's word with doing something in response. I'm going to pray and then uh, I want you guys to take a few minutes to greet one another, especially our guest, and then I'll ask you to return in a few minutes for a brief church family conference. Father God, we lift you up in praise. God, thank you for this message uh, from James. God, uh, we, we're all experiencing uh, trials in our lives. And uh, God, we know that your word never says anything but that that's what's going to happen. This is a, a world that, that was corrupted by sin. And God, and in that, uh, in your perfect will, there are diseases, there are problems, there are family problems, there are relationship problems. And God, uh, as, as James says, trials of many kinds. God, uh, we thank you that, uh, that, that our nature, that, that makes us a creature who cannot 100% avoid sin, that you sent in your perfect righteousness, you sent your perfect son into the world to dwell in us in his spirit, God, to make us clean and righteous in your eyes. Uh, God, that's, a, that's a, a picture of love right there. And uh, it's love that, that we don't always deserve. And God, we thank you for that sacrifice. As uh, we go through the coming week, God, remind us of these things. God, when we get down and when things happen as they will, remind us, God, to look forward to our eternal life. In other words, look at our lives from your perspective. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.